Thanks for tuning in to Becoming Something, where we promise to keep the conversation honest and real for young adults in their 20s and 30s. Every moment we live is training for a future moment, and that's why we do this podcast, because we want you to be prepared for everything that life is going to throw at you. Our hope with this podcast is that it would help you become all that God desires you to be. So with that in mind, let's jump right in to this week's episode of Becoming Something. What's up, podcast world? It's your boy, JP. Coming at you from Be So Live. Nate and Kathy are out in the audience fielding questions from a thousand of our closest friends. So let's Let's go. go. I've got the first one. Come on, we're in. In it to win it. Howdy, my name's Jackson. Stoked to be here. Um, I have a question about the podcast, so I'm stoked that all three of you guys are here. Relating to the podcast, I understand that outreach and influence is a huge part of the role of uh, the Becoming Something podcast and in the listeners' lives as all of us are all here. Um, Do you ever get nervous that you could be influencing them incorrectly, and how do you keep yourself accountable to know that your influence is spirit-led? The last part, that your answer is spirit-led, is that what it says? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, um, do you ever... uh, get concerned that you're answering questions incorrectly or like sending them out with bad theology or bad ideas and how do you know that your questions are spirit-led and that's a great question and so i think the concern of leadership right is is just that that people follow you you know that's the nature of a leader if you ever wonder like hey am i a leader just look behind you if people are following you you're a leader everyone's a leader in in some sphere of influence leadership is synonymous with influence and so in the day and age of social media TikTok, all the things people are influencing without proxy and so they're not geographically near them in fact we did a, a podcast on this uh, recently uh, on this very discussion i think the gift of christianity is um you have a path to forgiveness when you miss it. So it's like, how do you know your questions are spirit-led? Sometimes they're not. Uh, how do you know you're not influencing people the wrong direction? Sometimes we are. E- everyone does. And so I think it's just, and, and we're all on a journey. And that's what's really important for young people to understand is like what you believe today is not going to be what you believe 10 years from now. And I know you just absolutely think there's no way that's true. But as you continue to get in God's word, and sanctification is a process. Sometimes people will call the church and say, hey, am I welcome there? We say, absolutely, you're welcome there. And they say, well, so you're, so you're not going to try to change me. And it's like, oh, no, no, well, we're not going to try to change you. But that's what the Holy Spirit does is he changes you. That's the essence of sanctification is you are being conformed into something. Some would say you're becoming something, right? And so as, as that happens, I think we just have to keep short accounts with one another. Say, you know what? I said this once, but I don't, think I, I don't think I agree with that anymore. And then I would say also just for people who we're all in an echo chamber. Like we're all in this echo chamber of ideas and learnings. And so it's important to know that the people that we're consuming and that we're learning from and that are influencing our ideologies and beliefs, that they're sometimes wrong. And so we don't want to over-index on that. And so when I read the scripture, I read the Bible with commentaries, you know, preparing sermons every single week. But at first I want to look at the text for what it is, and I want to kind of read it as though, like, I'm like, all right, what does that mean? I always use the term, like, I'm on a deserted island. Like, what does that say? What does that say? What is the text that the Holy Spirit preserved, and what does it mean? Like, what did he want me to read thousands of years later? And then I kind of go, all right, what, what is the context? What else is happening? What does it mean? Then kind of go into commentaries, read different perspectives on it. But, um, and then I would say to the second part of the question as well, how do you know it's spirit-led? is, man, everything we do, I hope, is covered in prayer. Uh, prayer is one of our core values at Harris Creek, and so it's not an aspirational core value. It's an actual core value. And so, you know, I hope we're praying every single day uh, in regards to God influencing our words, our thoughts, our ideas, our relationships, and friendships. But man, make no mistake about it, I'm going to miss it. Like that's absolutely, and not just like futuristically, looking back, I have missed it countless times. Countless times. Like you say, hey, when? Well, when? Give me that. I'm like, a lot of times <laughs> there's been things like, yeah, I don't think I'd say that like that anymore. Uh, That's been one of the really cool things, too, of just leaving one church that I've been at and grew, like, became a believer at, 
grew up at and then moving into Waco, a different uh, culture and context, church context, you just learn new things, new ideas and whatnot. So great question. So that's great. Uh, we actually have no more time. JP went over. And, uh, <laughs> hey, hey, we got a question over here. So I know you've mentioned on the podcast before how you would generally recommend dating in high school. So if I have a younger brother who is considering that, how would you recommend I go about telling him that it's a bad idea or like why would you recommend it against it in general? It's, uh, uh, all the speakers are facing that way, so it's hard for me to, to hear the question. But I think you said dating in high school, was that it? Yeah, and so it just depends on what you mean by dating, right? And so I, I heard you say, my, uh, my little brother, how would, I, how would you go about me having that conversation with him? And so like now I have, uh, I have daughters, I have a daughter in high school, and, um, and it is the current of culture, is everyone, like most people here, a lot of us, you know, we went to, to you know, prom or, or some high school dance or whatnot, you have boyfriends and girlfriends, check yes or no, like just all of the things. And you know, the, the Song of Solomon says, do not awaken love before it's time. This is, man, this is really fascinating to me. But that term, awaken love, that's quite literally what happens. Like one day, the opposite sex has cooties, you know, and you're just like, oh, you don't even notice them. And then one, and then like somebody kind of brushes up against your hand or you, you catch a, a scent of perfume or, or usually it's like just shampoo kind of thing. And you're like, you're like, whoa. And now you, like something's awakened is what happens. And, and that is in somewhat a controlled uh, situation. Meaning that if you kind of stay in this place where it's like, hey, just friends, just friends, just friends, and that's like high school, what should dating look like in high school? It should look like a really sweet friendship, you know? I mean, that's the truth. Because if you start making out in high school, you've definitely awakened love before it's time, and you don't have any outlet, you don't have to do with the, the uh, sexual arousal, you don't have any outlet to, that's like, what do I, you can't get married, like, what, what do I do now for years and years and years and years? And so what you're going to do is you're going to cross boundaries. That, that's what's going to happen. I mean, that's the way that that plays out. Unless it's like, oh, this is a really sweet friendship. We hang out in groups. You know, I, I can't, I don't need to deny the fact that my heart likes them, uh, that, that sometimes I think about them when they're not there. And, and it's like, okay, so, and, and you're my date to the, to the school functions, but that's it. Like, we don't have, what happens in dating today, even, well, and especially 20s and 30 somethings, is it's like we play marriage. This idea, it is a new concept. You've heard me say this, I'm sure uh, uh, most of you have. It is a very new concept, relatively speaking. The way that we date, it, it's like you, you jump into a relationship and play marriage. Somebody challenged me on this recently, and so I, like, I went back and was like, all right, I want to make sure I'm right. 127 years old is 127 years ago is when the, the term came in the English language for the very first time, and it was a euphemism for prostitution. To turn a date or to take a date was to, you know, exchange an experience for sexual favors. And so you fast forward now to 2023, and it's really similar. And so I would just encourage all of you, like, don't date the way the world does. I'm not trying to kiss dating goodbye. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying, hey, date in a way that has a purpose and intentionality with the end goal in mind, which is to get married. Like, marriage is a God-ordained institution. Dating is absolutely not a God-ordained institution. So that's a lot. What I would tell my, uh, you're, you know, it's going to be difficult, right? because I don't know how much credibility you have with him. So what I try to do is with my children, I try to tell them what they're going to see. And so it says, hey, you're going to see a lot of drama, a lot of girls crying. You're going to see some pregnancy scares. You're going to see some breakups. Uh, you're going to see gossip like, hey, people talking poorly about each other. All of that is born out of this idea of dating in high school. Just watch it and observe it. And, and then let's talk about it and say, hey, do you think that's a good idea? Let's talk about who it's going well for and who it's gone poorly for, and, and it, are there more gone poorly for or more gone well for, and, and we just have those conversations. It's good. Okay, we have one right here. Hi. Um, Hi. I've been memorizing scripture lately, yeah. but I find myself just memorizing words, not meaning. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to know what you think, like why it is important to memorize scripture and yeah. how to do that effectively. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you live here, right? 
Yeah, it's kind of but fairly like new believer, right? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Can we give her a hand? She yeah. just recently trusted Christ. <laughs> just to say again, welcome home. You know, I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to the family. It's going to be fun just to share eternity with you and all these friends. Um, I think, yeah, I think that um, go slow on the, on the memorizing scripture. Uh, think about, there's an application to scripture. And so that's what's helpful to me. Like I'm, we make that joke yesterday about Ephesians 4.29. It's like, I know that scripture because I need to, right? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up so that it may, be, so that it may benefit those who listen. And so just for me to reflect on that throughout the day, I do not let any unwholesome talk. So as I memorize scripture, where, where from the position you're at, where it's like, okay, I'm just kind of, the Bible's new to me, I'm reading some of it for the first time, I would think, okay, what, what is it that I need to God to inform in my life? Like, what do I want to, what are those foundational truths about God that I want to hold on to? And then what are the hurts, habits, and hangups in my life that I need healing from? And I would begin to memorize scripture that has to do with those things. And uh, I don't think it's, I don't think you need to, you know, start out the gate memorizing uh, a chapter or even a book or a book or even a chapter. I should have said that backwards. I would think about just some, some really helpful foundational verses. Uh, Romans um, 12, 1 and 2, James 1, 19, Ephesians 4, 29. Proverbs uh, um, thirty-one thirty, Proverbs four twenty-three, um, Matthew 16. six thirty-three. What'd you say? John three sixteen. John three sixteen. Yeah, yeah. John three sixteen. Now, honestly, that's a great one. So I know that's your don't, only verse you've memorized. Don't ask me for it. I'm not totally sure what it is. Oh my gosh. Tim Tebow does. Tim Tebow. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Um, yeah. So I was wondering how you deal with um, failed expectations from parents, and I was thinking, okay, forgiveness. But my follow-up question is, do you communicate failed expectations and or do you apologize for having those expectations on parents? Yeah, man, wow. That's so relevant to everybody. Um, I think that it depends. <laughs> you know, not, to, not to avoid the question at all, but it's, it's hard like, to know what you're talking about if it's like, man... I really thought we would live in this kind of house. So that's like one kind of expectation. And it's like, hey, I really thought you wouldn't hit me. You know, that's another kind of expectation. And so I think it, it, it is the nature of the, con there's, a, there's a Grand Canyon a, a chasm between those two expectations. And so I think, it, are my, I have to start with the question, are my expectations reasonable? And, um, and let's assume that they were reasonable expectations. Uh, I think with anyone, we can go and say, we're talking about parenting, right? Make sure I heard that right. Uh, with anyone, we can go to them and say, hey, this is how I thought this would go. And, and like when you didn't show up to pick me up or when you didn't uh, want to visit me or when you didn't, you, know, you didn't seem excited for the thing that I thought you'd be excited for, man, that really hurt me. I think that's just a great practice in Christianity. That phrase, guys, if you leave here with that, it's worth the price of admission. You hurt me when? To say that you, to communicate to someone that you are hurt by them, it's a really vulnerable place to be. But it, it, what it does is it takes your kind of uh, emotional vulnerability and it puts it in their hands so that they can fix it. It's like, hey, I was hurt when you did this and you say something really specific, which means sometimes you have to, you have to take time to really sort that out in your own heart. Cause it's like, for some of us, we're like, man, I'm really hurt and I don't know why I'm just hurt. You just hurt me. And I don't know. And it's like, what did I do? And I don't know, you know? And I, I think just to go slow and to say, okay, this is what it was. Like, this is when I got hurt. When you said or did or didn't do or didn't say this thing. And man, that is amazing training for marriage amazing training for marriage. And you can start right now with roommates. And, you know, with roommates, you can say, hey, I was really hurt when, you know, you left your dishes in the sink and you didn't do them and they stayed there for 16 weeks, you know? <laughs> and now it's a science experiment. Like, that hurt me because <laughs> now I've got black mold in my lungs or something, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, just to, to talk through that in those really clear ways. And, and then if somebody ever says that to you, you can say, will you please forgive me for. And, uh, and so I think it does, it all kind of hinges on the kind of expectations that have been missed in parenting. That's great. Here we go. Hey, um, I just have a question that was on the board um, that wasn't question or asked. Can like we change 
God's mind with prayer and with that, like in Exodus, when, when uh, Moses would petition to God and God would yeah. relent yeah. kind of thing. So. Yeah. Can we change God's uh, mind in prayer? Is that, is that number two? Is it looking like that's going to get chosen? Things, things you need to know before you're engaged. Wow, it's 2021. Uh, can oh. prayer change God's mind? Okay, I'm going to take it. Uh, the, um, so in Exodus 32 and Jonah 3, which is funny because we're in Jonah right now at Harris Creek, uh, there, those are the two, mo- two times where it says like God relented, the, the Hebrew is, is odd, um, repented, changed his mind. Um, and in, in neither of those places would I say God was like caught off guard, like the outcome surprised God. So this, the, it goes against the character of God. And so I think often when we're trying to explain God in our language, like our words fall short. And so we have to zoom out and look at the, the full spectrum of the Bible, like all of the manifold wisdom of God, like everything in the scripture to understand like, oh, like God is somehow influenced by what we do. And yet he knew everything that was going to happen from eternity past. So like before time was even a construct, God knew everything that would be. And so this is, what is that? This is a little bit like real ethereal. Like, but um, people say, well, like, is, is, there, is there a one? Like, is there someone that I'm supposed to marry, for example, right? Is there, is there the one out there for me? And I would say, absolutely not. God has given you a pool of people to choose from. Um, you, you could be happy, uh, content, have an amazing life with hundreds of thousands of people. Like, that's, that's the truth. But then you, if you said, but, but doesn't God know everything so he knows who I'm going to marry? And I'd say, yes, right? And those two ideas can sit side by side and not contradict each other. Meaning God's not like waiting for you to find the person that he's ordained before creation for you to marry. And, um, and even the fact that like Genesis 3, the fall happened, it's not God's first desire. Now he had a plan from the beginning of time of how he was going to fix that. So what does that have to do with prayer? I think that uh, our prayer, it, it changes our heart more than it changes God's heart. And so as we're praying, we can pray. Matthew 7 says we can pray for anything we want. And that he's, he's like a loving father who desires to give good gifts to his kids. So we can pray, would you, I want to marry him. Uh, I want to drive a Ferrari. I want a, I want a seven-figure job. And I want to live in that amazing house. You can pray that way. Like it's not even a sin to, to, to talk to God in that way, because if that's the desires of your heart, he already knew it. But as you're asking him for those things, we need to add into that, and Lord, would you align my heart with what you desire? Uh, I, I, may not, I may not want what you want. And so the psalm says, delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And that first part, delight in the Lord, right? Delight in the Lord. What does it look like for the for, for God to be the greatest affection of my heart, for God to be my greatest desire. Lord, if I never have a car or a husband or a house at all and I'm homeless on the street, but I have you, that will be enough for me. <laughs> like, who's that true for, right? How do we get there, God? How do we get, like, would you move my heart there all while allowing me to express these things to you? And, you know, every metaphor falls short in regarding, regarding a relationship with God, but the one that Jesus gives us is, is a child and a father, and a father who loves that child. And I can just tell you, now that I have three children, that I love to pay attention to them and, and to take note what they want and to give it to them whenever I can, like whenever it's going to be okay for them. Like if they want to get ice cream, and I don't have a great reason to say no to ice cream, like let's go and get ice cream. You know, I, I'm, I'm just like, yeah, I want to be that dad. And, and at the same time, uh, we can't have ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I'm going to have, I'm going to have, you know, governance, stipulations, restraints that ultimately bring them freedom. And so um, I don't think prayer changes God's mind in the way that we mean when we say change God's mind. 
I would also follow it up as like, hey, why would you want to change God's mind? You know, like if God is all knowing, like I can just tell you my salvation story look like if God's in the, in the driver's seat, uh, I mean, if, 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 if there's a God, a creator, then why am I going to be in the driver's seat if I can let him be in the driver's seat? And so if there's a God who knows everything, he's going to be way better driver than you are of your life. And so it's like, God, I, in Jesus' praise, it's like, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. And I think that is the prayer of all of our hearts. It's like, Lord, this is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want, but not my will, thy will. And then I think it's fair as we wrestle through that. It's like, but why wouldn't God want my parents to stay together? Why wouldn't God want my mom's cancer to be healed? Like, why wouldn't, my, why wouldn't God want, right? And, and, it, and I don't know is the honest answer. But I would also pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, like, why would God want his son to be brutally murdered? And now it all makes sense. But in the Garden, it wouldn't have made sense to me. If I was there and I was Peter, I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Like, why is God going to let Jesus die? This doesn't make sense. But then it does. And uh, I, think, I think, you know, maybe the biggest expression in, in heaven is like, oh, that's what you were doing. You know, oh, and like right now, it's a stained glass window and we're this close to it. And all we see is shards of glass and it's ugly. But one day in, from eternity, you're going to look at that stained glass window and you're going to see the mosaic of the most beautiful picture ever of what God was doing in the most heinous of circumstances. And it's all going to make sense. So, it's good. Over here. You went last time, Kathy. We're over here. Thank you. Um, okay, so something I really struggle with in ministry is kind of accepting where people are at in their walk and the, like, the rate at which they're growing. And so I think in the world, like social media and everything that we're in, we see a lot of the highlights. So we hear a lot about radical transformations and stuff like that, even in your story, like sex, drugs, and uh, hip hop, you know, or like John Elmore, right? <laughs> John Elmore has a crazy story too, you know, of just radical transformation, or at least that's what it seems like from the outside looking in. And so even if I think my transformation was radical, like from a prideful perspective, it's hard for me to accept people in their growth. Cause I think, well, if the Holy Spirit's in them, they should be doing X, Y, and Z. And why don't they, why can't they just get this figured out? And I guess, have you struggled with that in ministry? And how do you, I guess, love people where they're at? Man, I've got a great story on that. Um, I don't think we have time to tell it, but I'll say this, I call it the older brother syndrome. And, um, and so in Luke 15, you have the prodigal son. Many of you have heard the story. They're on the dad's estate. The younger brother says, hey, dad, I'd love my inheritance now. The, the loving father gives the younger brother the inheritance. It says he goes off to a foreign land and, and squanders it on wild living. And so kind of, you know, drug, sex, and hip hop in his case. And so um, he, he wakes up. He, he's... You know, he's a, a Jewish boy, a Hebrew boy, and now he's in a territory where there's pigs. Pigs were unclean. They wouldn't have been near them. He's feeding those pigs. He longs to eat what the pigs are eating. Like, this is a, a destitute. It's a, a desperate situation. Older brother remains on the estate, is faithful, uh, works with the dad. The younger brother says, hey, my dad's slaves eat better than me. I, I'm going to go back to my father and ask him if I can be one of his slaves. Dad sees him from a long ways off, runs to him, uh, throws the robe around him, kisses his neck, puts a ring on his finger, kills the fattened calf, and um, throws a party. And the younger brother says, hey, I've been here the whole time. Like, you've never had a party for me. Like, we've never had any filet. Like, we've never had a meal, like what's up, and I've served you faithfully, right? Tell you that story because I think that is the natural progression of the believer. We are the prodigal son. We come, we experience the grace of the Father. He puts his robe around us. He restores us to the estate. Now we're on the estate, but as we grow on the estate, as we mature, which in I say in air quotes because it's head knowledge, we learn about God, we learn our Bible, then, then we say, okay, we have no patience now for the prodigal. The one that we were, like our hearts hardened, cynicism has kicked in. And so it's like, how do we stay close to our depravity? In my own life, like you, you said, so I was enslaved to pornography and, and just had a, a tremendous struggle. Couldn't find freedom from pornography. But now when you know, somebody says, hey, I'm struggling with porn, I'm like, get rid of your phone. 
Like, what's wrong with you, you know? And that's that older brother mindset. Now, there's truth to what I'm saying. Like, somebody needed to say that to me. I need to say that to them. And I can even say that sternly, but it has to be with lots of patience because people were patient with me. And so that's what I would say to you. People were patient with you. Like, they, they, they you know, you went the wrong way time and time again, and they just, they were a road sign saying, no, it's that way, it's that way. And so, so much of ministry is just being a road sign. And your biggest problems are your future pastors. I mean, the biggest messes in front of you are your future missionaries. And so what does it look like just to, to hold fast to that hope, knowing that the Holy Spirit is doing something in their life and God's timing is not your timing? But God who sits outside of time sees the finished product. And that's what I would say to all of you is like he doesn't love the future version of you. Like he doesn't love you when you get well, when you get right, when you, you stop sleeping around, stop vaping. The, the guy's not like, I'm, well, I'm just kind of waiting for that moment to shower them with love. Like, no, he's crazy about you right now. Like he sees, he, like God's outside of time. And so he sees the end from the beginning and he's able to, to love the glorified version of you right now today because anything you do, he paid for. So it's, it's said, it's, I've heard it said, you know, when God looks at me, he sees Jesus. I think when God looks at me, Jesus removes all of the sin and transgression so he's free to just love me as he loves his son. Like that, that's, that's what Jesus says about us, that God loves you like he loved him. I just read that in the Bible, that God loves you like he loved his own son, Jesus Christ. And that's amazing, profound reality. And it's not when you're perfect. So if that's how God loves us, that's how you have to love that, that person in front of you that you're ministering to. It comes with lots of prayer, lots of patience, and, and just remaining close to your own depravity. You say, except for the grace of God, therefore go I. So Luke and Samantha here from Tennessee. Actually, oh, up here, up here. I don't oh, know that I'm oh, 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 you're two o'clock. Here we go. Okay, got it, got it. <laughs> Luke you're and Samantha here from Tennessee, actually celebrating one week of an awesome marriage so far. <laughs> And what what have y'all done the, this last week? Do what? What have y'all done like this last week? <laughs> what? Did you, honey, did room. you go anywhere? I, I, what? But in Genesis 1, when God gives the command to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, was that just for Adam and Eve? Or is that for us as believers to take practically and literally today? And what does that look for? You go, know, go one people? more time for me. Uh, so in Genesis 1, with the first command to be fruitful and multiply, was that just for Adam and Eve, or is that for uh, us as Christians, as a married couple today? And what's that look like practically for young married couples? Uh, that's great. <laughs> Did you know he was going to ask that? Oh, wow. No. Can, I, can I stand here? Is that okay? Is, is that, no, I'm, I'm asking them. Y'all are like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. Um, Wait, do I need to move this, though? <laughs> What? Don't touch the camera. Dude. Okay, now he's no, back yeah. in it. Yeah, you don't it's move anything. Don't move anything. Just kidding. That was me. Oh, don't move God. anything, Nate. Um, be fruitful and multiply is, uh, no, I think that's for us. And so, man, this is a really fascinating, <laughs> all, these, all these questions like provoke things. Uh, um, and then, let me, I'm going to do this fast, okay? So hang in there with me. Like, this is worth leaving here, like taking notes on. This blew my mind when I learned it, okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The, the Spirit of God's hovering over something. What, how does it describe it? Anybody know? Yep, 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 yep. What'd you say? Formless and? Void. Void or empty, right? So, so the, the Spirit of God's hovering over something and it's, it's without form and there's nothing in it. It has no contents. And so the Spirit of God begins to create. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit begin to form, separate upper expanse from lower expanse, sea from land, shaping mountains, like literally forming like Plato, like just shaping this thing and then filling it. So it's empty and without form. He begins to form it and fill it. He creates plants, animals, uh, ultimately humans, and makes male and, and man and woman in his image, the Imago Dei, 
and says now. So this is the amazing part. He says, okay, the problem in the beginning was it was formless and empty. Now I've created you in my image to be rulers, to rule over the fish of the sea and the the, uh, land animals. And what I want you to do as rulers is I want you to form the earth and fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it or, or give it shape. So God took his responsibility and passed it on to us. Then one chapter, turn of a page, it all comes crumbling down. Sin enters the world. And and if you look at the consequences of sin, he specifically says, now childbearing is going to hurt. You will have painful labor. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And then he says, and you're going to work the ground and it's going to fight against you. It's going to produce thorns and thistles. And so forming and filling are now difficult. So as image bearers in the Imago Dei, as rulers made in the image of God here on this place that he's allowed us to steward, it is our responsibility to form and fill the earth. What does that look like? Grow a garden. Like, make things beautiful. Write incredible music. Paint pictures that people look at with awe and wonder. Uh, Build a house and make it beautiful and and decorate your living room as a home. And, 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 And if you desire marriage, get married and have lots of babies. Psalm 127, a quiver full of them. Okay, if you don't get married or do not desire marriage, make disciples. That's the whole, this is the first great commission. It shows up in Genesis that we would, when he says fill the earth, he's really saying fill the the earth with my followers. You have plenty of non-followers of Jesus to choose from to say sit in my beautiful living room, right, and, and learn about my amazing God. And, and this is the essence. So yes, if you're saying, should we have lots of babies? Yes. <laughs> Nate, you got someone? I'm like ready over here with mine, but. Okay, Wait, okay we, got, we, got, we got some over here. Okay, uh, you were talking about God being outside of time. And if he's all knowing and he's all good, um, would he create someone who would maybe never come to know Christ and never come to know him? Yeah, would he? Is it is it within his character? I mean, he he does, right? I mean, that the reality is he does. And so Ephesians refers to objects of wrath. I think it's often misunderstood. Romans nine is a pretty problematic uh, text uh, as you read it. And so um, this is like the like this is like all of Reformed theology kind of hinges on this this chapter. And um, I, here's what I know about the character of God, okay? I mean, these are deep questions. This is not like last year. Like last year was like, uh, how do I get him to like me? Uh, <laughs> this is like, can God create a rock so big he can't move it, you know? And uh, all right, <laughs> okay. And so, okay. Um, okay, I lost my place in my mind, sorry. Um, okay, He First Peter 3, um, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness, but he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So not wanting anyone to perish. So it is, it is not God's desire that anyone go to hell, is what this is saying. He's saying, hey, here's, here's, the, spirit, here's the heart of God. I don't want anyone to go to hell. And, he, and he's saying, hey, I'm, and I'm patient with you. Now, what does that mean? He's like, hey, he has this call on our lives that we would tell people. I think the like, lack of evangelism today within the church is, is maybe the greatest indictment on the American church. Like there was never really a believer who, there was never really meant to be a believer who wasn't actively thinking about how to recruit others into the faith. Like this is like foundational to the true Christian church. And so uh, the problem is, like God is, is love, the scripture, John tells us that, First John tells us that, God is love, and, and love desires a choice. Like if to love someone, the only way that you can experience love is if they have the option to hate you. 
if they don't have the option to hate you, then what you experience is not love, it just is. Like, so it, the, it's, it's kind of like light and darkness, cold and hot. Uh, you, you remove the absence, you remove heat, you're left with cold. You remove, uh, um, you remove light, you're left with darkness. Uh, you remove love, you're left with hate. Like, that's what's in the void. And so God kind of comes in and he brings something. And he says, I am love. And so the essence of love is, is this option. So God could have made us robots that were hardwired at some point in our lives to choose him. But somehow our free will interacts with the sovereignty of God in ways that I don't completely comprehend. It's called an, an antinomy. An antinomy is two ideas that contradict each other, but they're both correct. Light, if anything exists in waves, it cannot exist in particles. If anything exists in particles, it cannot exist in waves. Yet light exists in waves and particles. This is an example of an antinomy. Do we have free will? Yes. Is God completely sovereign and in control? Yes. How do those things fit together? I have no idea. Um, no one does. And if they told me how, I wouldn't believe them. I mean, that's, I don't want a God that I can understand. You know, I don't even understand women uh, and, 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 or my labradoodle. And so much less do I want a deity, do I want a deity that, that I understand. Like there is so much of the world I, I don't understand. I don't understand my wife's love for our labradoodle specifically. <laughs> it's confusing. And, and yet it is and I have to live, you know, I get to coexist with that and, um, and, learn, and learn how to move forward with that. And so I don't think God wants anyone to perish according to his word. Uh, that's not his first desire. And yet the fall happened and we are corrupt and we're running from God. And somehow the grace of God grabs some of us. And it is it's the greatest mystery that he saves any of us. Like the most confusing thing to me is not that some people won't go to heaven. It's that I'll be there. That's confusing, you know. So how do you move from obeying God out of guilt to obeying God in love? Yeah. How do you go from obeying God out of guilt, out of love? So Galatians speaks specifically to this. There's this, there's this transition in the scripture that is like slave to an heir. And, and so you go from a slave to an heir. And so a slave is someone who's under authority that does what the authority says because the authority says it. It's a slave. And so um, if, the way I think about it is like growing up, we, I grew up on 20 acres, okay, in South Texas. And you have to mow the grass. And it was like the worst job ever. Like for a minute, I wanted to be able to, you know, ride the riding lawnmower. And then I mowed the grass one time. I was like, I never want to do that again. But it was my job. Like every, you know, every other Saturday, I'd have to mow the grass. And it was like all my friends are, you know, they're going swimming and playing volleyball and stuff. And I'm like, I'm mowing the grass. It was an all-day affair. And I hated mowing the grass. Well, at, at some point in that journey, I realized, like my dad kind of painted this picture for me. He, he wisely cast this vision, like, hey, this is your grass. And I'm like, what do you mean it's my grass? It's like, no, it's your grass. And he goes, no, no, but you know what I'm I'm going to die. He since has. He's like, this is your grass. Like all, everything that's mine is going to be yours. And that's like what God is calling you to, if you go back to the Genesis narrative, is he's not saying, hey, take care of my stuff. He's saying, my stuff is your stuff. You are an heir and an heiress. You have, a you have an inheritance of glorious riches for me forevermore. I love you. So, um, you know, there's this thing called Christian hedonism. Which is like hedonism is like, hey, it, it, the, the satanic mantra, do as thy will. It's like, do whatever you want to do. Christian hedonism is like, hey, if you really understood what was best for you, you would do everything that God wants you to do because that would be the most selfish thing you could possibly do. Right? And so it's like you, you can obey God knowing that everything he desires for you is actually what's very best for you. And it's hard to, it's hard, like I see that in my children. Like they're like, hey, I want this. And for me to withhold that from them, they feel like I'm mean, but I just have greater knowledge than them. Now you can kind of like, you know, the one, the most, most of our audience right now is single. You can think like, well, man, how could it be loving if God is withholding a spouse from me when I really desire marriage? It's like, man, I don't know, but man, one day we're going to know. And, and you, you won't even second guess it for a second. It's hard to believe right now. And I'm not saying he's withholding his spouse from you, by the way. But if he was, one day that would absolutely make sense. And you would only be glad that he did. 
It's hard to believe that right now. And so I think just kind of starting with that foundational idea, man, that God is good, that he loves me, and that what he desires is actually for my own good. Hi. Um, so from a layman perspective, how do we go about community, like communicating needs and hurts that we see within a local church that's hurting ministry, but not coming out of like, I want to be the change, but I want to see like the gospel effectively communicated? Yeah, so just like when there's, when there's something going, when there's something happening in the church that's not right, how do we address it? Is that the question? She said basically, yeah. Basically, yeah. <laughs> Um, how would you say it in your, your words, Nate? Well, she said in layman's, and I'm more of an expert. So. Oh, gotcha. okay. Gotcha. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I, think it's, I think it's just as addressing it. And, and believe me, my, like, I, so I'm on the other side of this, right? So I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm asking you to do what people do to me, and I'll, I'll say I never feel like I have the benefit of the doubt if that makes sense. And so it's like, man, I'm, you know, leading a church is hard. I'm not trying to play the victim here at all. I'm just telling you it's hard and we have to make decisions with the, the best information we have. We're, we're not operating selfishly. You cannot please everyone. With every decision, someone's gonna be disappointed. And so I think just starting with like, am I right? You know, like, am I, like as you pray and kind of do the heart surgery, like is, is what I believe to be true actually true? Are we really missing this? And then I think you can just say, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit like start with, hey, what can you be encouraged by? Hey, this is what I see happening in our church that encourages me. And this happening over here is confusing to me. And so rather than gossip about it or ask others about it or talk to other people about it, I thought I would just go to the source and ask you, can you please help me understand why we do this? And hopefully in every uh, church governance, in every kind of local expression of the church, the decision makers, if you will, the leaders have said, hey, here's a place where you can talk with me. So for example, for me here at Harris Creek, I say every Sunday I'll stand right here until the last person wants to talk. Like that's just kind of my preferred method because I, I love to see someone's facial expression. I want to hear them. I don't want an email. I just say, hey, if you have a question, like I'm going to be up here, just come up and ask. Like if you can be patient and you can wait, like I will talk to every person who will sit and wait to talk so that I can hear that and we can have an actual dialogue about it. And so, you know, hopefully your leadership has, you know, they, they either say, hey, email us here or talk to me here or call this number or whatever that is. You find that outlet and you say, hey, this is where I'm encouraged by movement of God. Um, I want to believe the best, but here's a question I have. And rather than air that to other people, I thought I would just come to you. And I, I think that's, that's where I would go. Okay, up here, JP. Hi. Um, I just want to say thank you for your advice with dating. My fiance and I are getting married this summer. What, and what? It is mostly thanks to you guys. <laughs> we also thought maybe Nate could marry us this weekend, but we oh, couldn't. Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. Come on, you know, right now. Come on. <laughs> we He's, couldn't get a marriage on. license in Texas fast enough. Oh, yeah. He's so actually, if you happen uh, to have a guy, just let us know. He's um, actually not ordained, so <laughs> that's it wouldn't tough. count. <laughs> Um, but you talk so much about conversations and dating, but what are some conversations that you wish you would have had an engagement to prepare for a Christ-centered marriage? So that, that actually is probably what we're going to talk about I, I in like 30 minutes. I feel like it should be a Q&A question because there are some married people in the audience. Yeah. So I'd hate to do a whole episode on something that wouldn't apply to everyone. Is that just me? Yeah. If she, if he can well, answer so, it right so here, now. So here's the deal. The, the people kind of voted. This I'm isn't like Kathy's conference. Else. Yeah. Hey. He could answer it right now. Hey guys, can we change those questions to accommodate whatever Kathy wants? <laughs> That's what I've been saying all along. Just my two cents. You, you decide, JP. <laughs> Things you need to know before you're engaged. Oh, but no, but you're asking when you're engaged. That's a different question. Oh. That's a different question. Totally. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say, uh, I mean, Go, go grab Scott's book, truly. It's, it's out there, ready or not. I mean, it, 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 tr it is literally that. I mean, it is, it is just a resource exclusively for that season. Have you guys read it? Ready or not. Huh? <laughs> oh, yeah, the people. Some of them for the Holy <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys read that book? Okay, hey, let's grab them. Hannah, we grab them two copies of Ready or Not, and we'll make sure they get that. 
Hey, on, on me, on me. You yeah, can put that thank on you, me. Nate. Thank you. Hannah, pull that out of Nate's paycheck. <laughs> here, go ahead. I got you right here. Uh, how do you, oh. Sorry. Oh, me or? Oh, perfect, perfect. Uh, how do you increase your love or your fear for the Lord? Or fear grow, of yeah, fear, fear, fear of the Lord. Yeah. So how do you increase your fear of the Lord? Uh, amazing, re uh, read an amazing book right now. I'm not trying to just like throw books at you guys, but The Awe of God by uh, John Bevere. And so the entire book, it's a daily reading to increase the fear of God. And so I would say I'm learning a lot about it. So that would be maybe my I don't know. Uh, but as far as affections, I always just say, hey, what makes you love God more? And that is a real mind bender for people because usually they have to get through the oh read my bible and pray and i'm like no 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 that i mean that's great if it does that's awesome it doesn't for me uh those are the disciplines so i do those at a necessity so that because they i know that they're growing something in me but like what what grows my love for god is a is a bubble bath and great rap music and a walk in you know nature <laughs> and uh and so you know but if i told you that you know if i'm like hey you want to, you know, you know, draw a nice bubble bath, light a candle, listen to some Dr. Dre, and then take a walk in the woods. You're going to be like, what? And I, not Dr. Dre. I meant Lecrae. And, um, <laughs> all right, you're going to be, you're going to be confused. So just to, to figure out, hey, what makes me love God more and do more of that? What distracts me from God and stop doing that? And then the awe of God by John Bevere. Uh, Kathy, you had somebody, I think. Yeah. Nate has someone. This might should be our last question. Okay. Just saying. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about the Sabbath and if it's a commandment Christians are to keep oh. a principle that is up to one's personal conviction um, or something that has been fulfilled in Christ or like a mixture of those. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a great question. Kathy, what would you say? Wow. I'm just going <laughs> to let you answer, bro. What did you say? I'm going to let you answer. It's cute with Jesus. Uh, Kathy and I talk about this a lot. Um, uh, it's, you know, here's the deal. Uh, Sabbath is the only of the Ten Commandments that's not repeated in the New Testament. I don't think that's by accident. Um, so keep holy the Sabbath day. Like every other commandment, the other nine are repeated in the New Testament. Jesus says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Um, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so uh, Sabbath, like the heart of Sabbath is dependence on God that, hey, I don't have to get it all done. Like, I can stop and, and trust God. And so I think that principle is extremely necessary. Like, we must have a mindset where we stop and, and we, you know, we acknowledge that it's okay if I don't get it all done because this world is not my home. I'm going to do the best I can and I'm going to sleep well at night. You know when you're not Sabbathing, when anxiety increases, you, you feel like you have to control it all, control increases. These are all symptoms, or can be, I should say, can be symptoms of not having a Sabbath mindset. I talked to a friend of mine who wrote a book on the topic of Sabbath, and, and it seemed, I read in the book, that who was it, seemed, it? Who was it? <laughs> it was Nate Hilgenkamp. And I, I read, I, 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 my takeaway from John Mark Comer's book was that that you should, you, you should Sabbath. And so we had a conversation about it and I, I love the way he answered because I, I said everything I just said right here. And he goes, yeah, but I, I am not disciplined enough to, to stay in that mindset without the weekly practice. And I was like, man, that's so honest and beautiful. And I'm like, I'm not either. <laughs> you know, what am I thinking? And so if John Mark Comer can say that, uh, he's more disciplined than most any of us. And so I think it's like, all right, there, there are some wisdom principles in creating time and space to kind of reset and to reflect and to make sure that God is in control. My, my, one of my favorite quotes, not in the Bible, is if dependence is the goal, weakness is the advantage. And so to stay in this place where we depend on the Lord, which is really like staying close to our own weakness, the way that Paul says it is um, about God, my grace is sufficient. Uh, your power is made perfect in my weakness. Thanks for tuning in to Becoming Something, where we promise to keep the conversation honest and real for young adults in their 20s and 30s. Every moment we live is training for a future moment, and that's why we do this podcast. 
because we want you to be prepared for everything that life is going to throw at you. Our hope with this podcast is that it would help you become all that God desires you to be. To find out more, visit becomingsomething.com.